Welcome to today's webinar, National Models and Methods for Achieving Equitable Development, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in association with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Brownfields and Land Revitalization Program and Office of Community Revitalization and the Smart Growth Network. My name is Michael Bayer. I'm the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and Project Manager for the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. The Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse is a project of the Smart Growth Network supported by the U.S. EPA's Office of Community Revitalization and managed by the Maryland Department of Planning. In addition to hosting webinars, the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse has a website at smartgrowth.org that provides information to help local decision makers foster healthy, resilient, and economically vibrant communities. The Clearinghouse is also the virtual home of the Smart Growth Network, a nationally recognized coalition of leadership organizations that have formally endorsed the principles of Smart Growth. This webinar is one in a series of webinars produced by the Maryland Department of Planning on Smart Growth and Planning topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. This webinar is also the sixth in a series sponsored by the U.S. and EPA's Brownfields and Land Revitalization Program and Office of Community Revitalization called Learning From and Leaning On Local Leaders to Revitalize African American Neighborhoods. Thank you for participating today. The full archive of previous programs, handouts, and links is available for viewing and download at smartgrowth.org. The views expressed by the speakers in this webinar are, the, are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the Maryland Department of Planning or the State of Maryland. We are recording this webinar and we'll be posting it on our website under the Webinar Archives tab. We encourage you to visit the website and to subscribe to our e-newsletter to learn about our upcoming webinars. You can also find out about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association, including one equity CM credit, as well as 1.5 CNUA CEU self-reported credits from the Congress for the New Urbanism. I will note that this is the first time we've offered the equity credit, which was new as of January 1st of 2022. To log your ASCP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account, and search for the name of today's event, which is National Methods and Models and Methods for Achieving Equitable Development. You can also search for event number 9230094. Today's panelists are Mashonda Taylor, Ernest Coney Jr., and Wanda Mallett. Mashonda Taylor serves at the, as the executive director of the Woodlawn Foundation, the lead organization of Woodlawn United, an alliance of partners committed to breaking the cycle of poverty in Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama's historic Woodlawn community. As a result of this collaboration, Woodlawn is reemerging as a vibrant and sustainable commun community where residents are connected to opportunities that help them thrive. Mashonda also serves as a commissioner for the Birmingham Planning Commission, an executive board member for the Jones Valley Teaching Farm, and an advisory board member for the Blackburn Institute at the University of Alabama. She earned a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from Loyola University, New Orleans, and a Master of Arts in Organizational Leadership from Gonzaga University. Ernest Coney Jr. is the Chief Executive Officer of the CDC of Tampa. He has more than 15 years of executive management experience, providing health, social, and economic programs to benefit low to moderate income persons and the elderly. Since joining the CDC in 2006, Ernest has helped to leverage more than $50 million in joint venture pro projects, including real estate and program service projects. Under his leadership, the CDC has created the Tampa Vocational Institute to address disproportionate rates of unemployment and underemployment in urban neighborhoods, developed multifamily housing projects, and has helped to create two prominent countywide cross-sector collaborations, the Economic Prosperity Center and the Safe and Sound Hillsboro, among other programs. He has an undergraduate degree from Dartmouth, Col Dartmouth College and a master's degree from the University of South Florida. Uh, Winetta Millette is a transportation planner and entre entrepreneur with more than 30 years of experience in transportation and land use planning. She is the owner of Millette Consulting and also serves as the Burlington Graham MPO Administrator in Burlington, North Carolina. 
During her tenure with the city of North Charleston, South Carolina, she developed a community impact assessment process that resulted in a $4 million community mitigation plan, the first of its kind in South Carolina and the nation. She has an MBA from Webster University and a bachelor's degree from the University of South Carolina. Following their presentations, our panelists will answer as many questions as time permits. You can submit a question anytime by using the questions tool located in the control panel on the right side of your screen. So to get started today, our session will be introduced with a short video message from Calvin Gladney, President and CEO of Smart Growth America. Thank you, Calvin. We're now going to sh uh, share a quick poll as we usually do to start our webinars, just asking where everybody is uh, today um, in the audience so that we can share that with you and with our panelists. And we'll leave this open for a, about 30 seconds or so to give folks a chance to respond. If you're having trouble responding, if you've been here before, you know you may need to leave uh, the full screen mode to be able to click on one of those five options and we'll give you all a few more seconds to respond, and then I'm going to turn it over to Cindy Nolan. And you will notice that there's also a handout that Cindy may mention in here to look at uh, some of the resources that are available from EPA as well. Give you another second or two, and we'll close this poll. Excellent. So today, 35% of our audience is from the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast, 28% from the South, 17% from both the West and Midwest, and we have a 3% international audience today. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Cindy Nolan, who is Chief of the Brownfields and Redevelopment Section in EPA Region 4, who will introduce this session. Welcome, Cindy. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today as we highlight three Southeast communities engaged in equitable development. I learned about these organizations and many other organizations in this EPA Region 4 Southeast area. Um, as we undertook a project in collaboration with our environmental justice team at EPA Region 4, Brownfields and Environmental Justice, looking for communities that are engaging with the residents in a highly successful way. And what we found was amazing work be being done by these NGOs in areas of housing and schools and community or green space, job creation, entrepreneurial development, healthcare, and overall improvement of quality of life, all at the same time. And all without gentrification, truly driven from the ground up by existing residents. And we really wanted to highlight these organizations. And we put seven of them in an equitable development brochure that Region 4 developed. And it's a handout for this seminar series. And we felt it was really important for all the communities that we work with in Brownfields and in our environmental justice program to really show what success looks like. And more importantly, to point out that success is actually nearby. They have communities to look toward that look like them, that have faced the same challenges that they face. And we will continue this project through this year. We'll expand it on our Region 4 website and we'll, we'll incorporate all of the communities that we have interviewed. So you can look for that at the EPA Region 4 website later in the year. In the meantime, two of the speakers represent community nonprofits talking about their models and their successes. First, we have Mashanda working with Woodlawn United, and that is a purpose-built communities model. Purpose-built communities is an organization based here in Atlanta, and they mentor and work with communities as a community of practice. Next, we'll hear from Ernest at CDC of Tampa. This is an amazing story. It's been a much long-standing nonprofit organization multi-generational. So there are many accolades and successes for this organization. And then finally, we're gonna hear uh, from Juanetta, who's gonna talk a little bit about um, a method that I, I felt needed to be highlighted because it is seldom used and it's called the social impact assessment. Many of our communities have impacts from federal projects, whether it's DOT, 
Corps of Engineers dredging or something like that. And what she did was really dig deep into a social impact assessment and use that to leverage and create social equity in the community being impacted by the harbor dredging. So we'll start with Mashanda and Woodlawn United. Mashanda. Thank you, Cindy, for the awesome introduction. And also thank you for everyone being here today. Um, it is a really awesome opportunity for us to share our work. Uh, we don't take it lightly that we get to share the amazing things that are happening in the Woodlawn community on this platform. So I wanna say good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mashonda Taylor and I'm proud to serve as the Executive Director of Woodlawn United, a place-based holistic uh, revitalization organization or community quarterback based in the Woodlawn community in Birmingham, Alabama. And over the next few minutes, I will define our model and collective impact strategy. And most importantly, how residents are the center and focus of our work. So in America, neighborhoods determine destiny. Research shows that place shapes life outcomes, but it's not enough to improve only a single aspect of a struggling neighborhood. To achieve racial equity, improved health outcomes, and greater economic mobility in neighborhoods that have suffered from decades of disinvestment, it takes a holistic approach. So the, like Cindy said, the model that we are using is a purpose-built communities model, and it's rooted uh, in 25 years of of longstanding uh, work and service happening in the East Lake community in Atlanta. And basically what happened in that community, uh, years of disinvestment, um, entrenched generational poverty, and the community members wanted to see a shift and change. And from what, what happened is that a community quarterback or a lead organization was created. And this organization thinks about what are the needs of the residents and of that community every day. But most importantly, we define the neighborhood. So when you think about uh, our work, it is not stretched over uh, many communities or over our city. It is deeply uh, concentrated into one area. And, uh, and I'll go into further how that uh, flows into the Woodlawn community. But we focus on three areas of work, creating a mixed income housing strategy, creating a career, uh, a cradle to career education pathway, and most importantly, thinking about the wraparound services, the amenities, all of the things that are necessary as you're transitioning that community from one phase to the next, and that's our community wellness bucket. So yes, we are part of a national network of members, and there are 28 communities doing this work across the country. Um, every community is different. Um, some are very single family entrenched. Some are just had nothing but vacant land and opportunity to build, um, but they're, all of our communities are all thinking about the same things and that, that is how do we take one, this one neighborhood or one community from, from being in entrenched poverty to the point where they can have success for themselves. So a little bit about Woodlawn. So Woodlawn is situated just east of downtown Birmingham, Alabama. It's a historic neighborhood that runs for about 15 blocks along the rail line. Uh, it thrived in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, white working class families, they moved here to find jobs, raise, raise healthy children and educate them in segregated schools. But quickly it deteriorated as Birmingham's industrial prominence faded and integration was achieved. So much of the middle class, white and black, moved to growing suburbs and Woodlawn be became a quickly deteriorating community. And it succumbed to urban neglect uh, after the creation of the interstate of 2059. So when you think about planning of a community, you had the rail line to its south, um, a highway that disconnected it um, on its east, and then uh, an airport to its, uh, to its north. So com our community was completely disjointed and disconnected. But even in still, uh, Woodlawn families still wanted, to, the people that remained still had a love and feel uh, and of growth and wanted this community to thrive. And though m many people might thought it was lost, the, the heart of Woodlawn is still very strong. Um, and it's entrenched in the matriarchs and the young people that are here wanting to see it thrive again. But this is just a little Woodlawn facts. Our community population is about 51, 41 uh, people living in the community, about 326 businesses, the median home value, $108,000 um, 
for a median home. And then, and this is gonna make sense a little bit later on, but 56.21% people have internet access or a subscription within the neighborhood. And that's gonna make sense a little bit later. When you think about the households uh, that sit below the poverty line, 38% of our residents sit below, 24% uh, is what the, the city uh, line is. But even more than that, there are many of our residents that sit either at or below this uh, poverty line. And our, our job is to make sure that we're taking the community, the people that live here now, not the people to come, but the people, the residents that live here now and give them the oppor opportunity to drive within their own neighborhood. And so that's how we were created. Uh, Woodlawn United was founded in 2010. Uh, it was a collection of residents and community partners and seed funding from the Mike and Gillian Goodrich Foundation. And, the, and, and everybody collectively came together. They wanted, to see what, they wanted Woodlawn to be its best self. So Woodlawn United was created as the community quarterback. And our mission is to serve as a catalyst and facilitator to, transfer, to transform or revitalize the Woodlawn community here in Birmingham. But we're inspired by our residents. Our residents, they carry this vision. They're the ones that set forth as to how and why we would do this work. The vision of Woodlawn United is to grow a safe and healthy community where children learn and play, families live in quality housing, parents work stable jobs, businesses thrive, and everyone contributes to the greater growth of Birmingham. Because we know that Woodlawn is just a smaller piece to a bigger city. But we want to make sure that we're one of those model communities in which we are the ones leading the way uh, for our city. So uh, about a year ago, we uh, just ended our first iteration of our strategic plan. And we continue to have conversations with our residents and our partners and our team. And we set out to figure out what are the next programmatic strategic priorities for our organization. And one of the, the biggest things, and you'll see this as you do our work, this work is rooted in partnerships. This cannot be done alone. Um, we are a nine member team um, and everyone comes with great um, skills and abilities, but to truly move a community from entrenched generational poverty, it, re it requires partnership. Most importantly, you also have to think about the education opportunities. Our residents don't get the ability to leave um, our neighborhood to, or move out of our neighborhood to have high quality schools. So it is imperative that education opportunities sit within the neighborhood. And then most importantly, this is a newer uh, strategic priority for us, is we have to think about economic mobility. If we wanna say that we wanna move people out of generational poverty, they have to have the ability to sustain and work for themselves, whether that be uh, owning a business or working um, a high quality job that is um, at or above a rate that they could actually take care of their families. The next one is mixed income housing, um, mixed income housing. So it's not just thinking about um, low to moderate income housing. It's also thinking about what are market rate um, availabilities within the neighborhood. Because we also realize if you put and allow people to live amongst one another, they will grow from one another and they will grow into each uh, to different income brackets if they are amongst uh, things that they can see. And lastly is wellness. So that's health opportunities, that's making sure um, the, the community is walkable. That's making sure that it's safe. That's making sure that there are grocery stores. Just thinking about the things that when you move into a community or you are in a community that you would want. So when we think about our strategic partnerships, together 40 community partners are working to end intergenerational poverty, but Woodlawn United is leading the way. We are the consistent. We are the community quarterback. We're the one that carries the vision for the neighborhood every day. And our offices are based in the neighborhood. And we wanted to make sure that if we were going to be here, that we wanted to be a long-standing, a long-standing partner with the neighborhood. And as the neighborhood was growing and shifting, that we were as well. These are a list of our partners, um, anywhere from the city of Birmingham to the housing authority, to our early learning center, or our newest addition to our education pipeline, um, a high quality K through six charter school that we've opened in the neighborhood, or even our federally qualified, uh, federally qualified health center um, or Christ Health Center. We wanted to make sure that if you lived in the Woodlawn neighborhood, that you had access to everything you needed. So our mixed income housing strategy. This is a very complex strategy and a lot of people, when, when it comes to housing, they only think about affordable um, housing measures. But when you think about it, 
all types of housing need to reside within a community. From the time someone is born to the time someone retires, we wanted to make sure that there was an, uh, a place where people could actually be within their, within their neighborhood and as their lives were transforming. So when we think about our uh, mixed income housing strategy, it, it's, it's rooted in opportunities regardless of socioeconomic status. So we wanna empower the legacy homeowners. We wanna manage the development of new housing opportunities across all income levels. And we wanna increase home ownership rates. And currently, the Woodlawn community has a home ownership rate of 30% or a little bit above 30%. We wanted to make sure that we had more stable community members and that they weren't as transient so they could actually benefit from the resources that were being provided in the community. And then also we wanted to reduce vacant and abandoned properties in the Woodlawn neighborhood. So how did we do that? And how are we doing that? So the most important thing, and what Cindy alluded to in um, the, the new document that the EPA just put out, um, site control was so important for our work. So when we first started here in 2010, one of the first things that we did was started to acquire property in the neighborhood. Uh, that was upwards to 150 properties that we acquired um, prior to the creation of the Birmingham Land Bank. So clearing titles, going through that full process, that was something that we did just to make sure that we could stabilize the neighborhood so people could not come in and basically buy property of, around us in which we could not really comprehensively develop our neighborhood with our community. With our, with our residents. So site control was one of the biggest pieces that we did. And then later on, as the land bank came on, uh, we purchased 90 properties from them. And so in, in the process, we've been able to look at how do we create not only affordable housing, median income housing, and market rate housing, and how do we not disjoint them and keep them separated? So one of the, one of the things that we were able to do, one of the first projects that we did because we knew we needed a high quality affordable option within the neighborhood and that was the Park at Wood Station. Park at Wood Station is 64 uh, townhomes. It was developed with Holly Hand Development. Um, we leveraged uh, a little bit over a million dollars in tax credits to a $13 million development. Um, let's, let's just say that 1,500 people applied uh, at the Park at Wood Station. That's only 64 units. 500 of them um, were, um, were actually available to move in um, so let's just say that we have a, a healthy waiting list, but it just tells you the importance of high quality, affordable housing um, in our neighborhoods. Uh, the next phase, uh, we, we, did, uh, we acted as the co-developer for market rate homes, and that was the cottages at Wood Station. We started with one spec home, um, and from there, it just completely blew out of control, and people that were either from the neighborhood before or just wanted to be a part of this process of growth started to move into our community. So we started to see some higher income levels move in, and they also wanted to be a part of its process. They wanted to make sure that they were working alongside of the existing residents that were here. And we were being very intentional when it comes to this whole idea of gentrification and displacement. I think the thing that, that is not always spoken and talked about is the fact there is a, the ability to have economic uh, empowerment and development within a neighborhood, but the important thing is that we need to be thinking about what are the unintended consequences or the means that displacement happens. So when we were thinking about the market rate homes, we made sure that we connected them uh, to already existing affordable housing. So affordable housing that will not um, turn over for at least 20 or 30 years. So it gives our ability, our, our residents, the ability to stay within a community, but then even live adjacent to people um, of higher income levels. The last phase um, that we're working on uh, is the cottages of Georgia, Georgia Road, and that is the median piece. Um, that is the hardest thing that we have done to date. Um, it is in partnership with the city of Birmingham, the Alabama Housing Finance Authority. Um, it will be eight additional apartments, 11 townhomes for purchase, and one single family for purchase. And this is going to be used uh, in coordination with the housing authority vouchers to allow people to purchase homes that have never purchased homes before in their lives. And so they will actually have the ability to stay within their neighborhood, but also have the ability to own. Over the next 36 months, we will put an additional 200 uh, units of mixed income housing in our neighborhood. Um, 80 of that will be of a transit oriented development that we are working on alongside our commercial revitalization partner, Rep Birmingham, 
uh, to create a mixed income housing apartment uh, or multifamily unit within the neighborhood that sits adjacent to our bus rapid transit that is coming in the next year. But in order to do that, we had to prepare the residents for that. And so many times people think, um, why aren't people buying, they ask why aren't people buying homes, but they don't have, if you've never had anyone in your family buy a home, it is necessary for you to have the training necessary to do that. So one of the things that we've done, our home, we've offered home ownership workshops. We are uh, helping with credit counseling, um, working with the volunteer lawyers program, just to make sure that they have, um, if there are any things happening with the community or within a, if, if they're trying to purchase a home from a family member, just to make sure that they have the right deed and they have the right um, uh, state planning opportunity. So we wanna make sure when they do finally get a house, they have a will. Um, but then also thinking about post-closing, like what, how do we make sure that they are a proactive homeowner? What we've seen in the community is that um, there are residents that, that live in apartments and in our homes, and they're just not active. And we want to make sure that they know exactly what's happening within their neighborhood so they can actually be a part of what, where it's heading. Um, I know there are many times that we, in, in, in our work, it's easy to get connected to the louder voices within our community. But we want to make sure that we have collective voice and that we're thinking about all of the residents in the neighborhood. The next phase is our cradle to career education pathway. Um, and it starts from the time that a child is born from six weeks to the time that they go into career. Um, the first project that we did was the James Russian Early Learning Center. Um, we had the ability to host the first lady of the United States last year, um, just to show the high quality mixed income nature of our uh, early learning center. Uh, we leveraged $3.7 million uh, for $6 million in tax credits. Um, serves 100 students, six weeks to four years old, but the priority is given to Woodlawn residents. We wanna make sure that they are able to attend. Um, it's not something just to put something within a neighborhood. We wanted to make sure that they could actually um, benefit from this process. So we make sure that we cheer the priority for our residents. The next phase of our education initiative is kindergarten through sixth grade. Um, and when I'm gonna go back once you see this. So our early learning center used to be a former bank building. And now we've turned that into a, a high quality early learning center. Our K through uh, five charter school used to be a church. And this church was going to sit vacant within our, within our uh, neighborhood. The residents of Woodlawn said that they wanted another education opportunity. Um, we listened um, and we had some really great successes and new successes from our partner in uh, East Lake of Atlanta with their Drew Charter School model. So we were able to bring this model to the Woodlawn community. Um, and we are now expanding upwards to seventh grade next year. I had the opportunity to sit with the students yesterday. Um, and when I tell you, when you provide the right environment, when you provide the wraparound services and give people the opportunity to see what success looks like, you see noticeable change within a community. Uh, we have family success plans for all of our students and families. So we're not just thinking about the child, we're thinking about how can we make sure that the, the parent has a higher job opportunity through workforce certification programs? And then also thinking about their quality of life when it comes to their housing. We wanna make sure that they're, we're transitioning them into a higher, um, higher quality, um, safe um, place for their children to grow up and live. But the newest piece is economic mobility for us. Um, there, we've had the ability to open 12 new businesses in the past two quarters. Um, is a lot of energy, but a lot of that was rooted in work that have been happening over the past five or six years within our Urban Maine initiative. Um, it's, under, it's a partnership between uh, the Woodlawn, Uni Woodlawn United and Brett Birmingham. And basically what it is, is we take community members, there are three members that are working, whether it's facade improvements um, or with our business association, because we have a formalized business association, um, our street market, which has birthed a lot of the different businesses that are your, we're seeing pop up um, in the community, but even facade improvements for the legacy business owners, we need to we need to shore up the businesses within our communities because they have the ability to give jobs. And what we saw is that Woodlawn is rich in non-federal job opportunities, but if we have the ability to scale um, the businesses and give them the opportunity to hire within the community we give people to stay within this area so not only do you have a place to live you have a high quality education opportunity but now you have a job 
community wellness, which is the catch-all bucket. Um, one of the things that we saw, and at least I saw working um, in partnership with our community members and our residents, is we needed to give residents the opportunity to learn and develop themselves. So we established this We Lead Fellowship where there are community members, all different generations, um, learning not only about what true leadership is, but they're also learning about budgets and private public private public partnerships, um, about zoning and variances. There are a lot of things that our community members are asked to vote on, but they have no earthly idea. So we are working um, in, in bringing the best and high quality speakers and trainers into the community, because at the end of the day, the work goes faster if they can lead themselves. The work goes faster if they have the ability to, uh, to know how to make decisions and not only make the, the right decisions, but that it's rooted in um, actual learning and, and, and education behind it. So they've, uh, they've dealt with DEI work, servant leadership, um, economic development, and truly understanding what's really happening within the neighborhood. The other piece are, um, is our homeowner rehab program. So we could not build new without addressing the health and safety concerns of our existing residents. Uh, to date, we have 128 rehab projects and have expended $1.2 million uh, for existing homeowners, whether that could be uh, issues with plumbing or paint, um, accessibility, updating kitchens. We wanted to make sure that the, the legacy homeowners um, did not just see new things happening around them, but they also had the ability to update their homes as well. But our work is rooted in community engagement. Um, when we think about public safety, when we think about blight, um, we have a formalized normal neighborhood association system here in the city of Birmingham. There are 99 neighborhoods. Woodlawn comprises of four of them. And for the first time, all of these neighborhoods are communicating with one shared vision and they think about a one Woodlawn. And that's why it's so important that we are Woodlawn United. Um, so the neighborhood associations are speaking to the real life issues that are happening in the community, but they're also providing the solutions. I do believe that when it comes down to it, solutions reside in communities and when it when we think about the planning and the outside things that are happening either in city government or planning or national government whatever it is it is important to get to the ground level to understand the real lived experiences of the people but looking forward uh, we will have additional phases of housing um, like i said we will have 200 additional units that will uh, that we will build over the next 36 months Thinking about community Wi-Fi, uh, our community was disjointed uh, in this global pandemic because there was not Wi-Fi access here in our neighborhood. So children did not learn. Uh, people were unable to uh, uphold and keep jobs. So it's important for us to think about what is a community Wi-Fi strategy um, that can be put in place for our neighborhood. Um, we will. We are expanding to a family success center uh, and thinking about empowerment. So making sure that there's not only um, access for entrepreneurial resources, but also thinking about our certification programs. And then last but not least, we will expand our, our middle school. Our students want to keep growing with us. And so it is our responsibility to find an additional space to house them. And I think that is it. This is my contact information and I'm going to turn it over to Ernest Coney Jr. So thank you, Ashonda, for that. And so thank you for that, Ashonda. I'm really excited to be here. Um, again, Ernest Coney Jr. with the CDC of Tampa. And as we look at the issues that we're talking about, we realize that every great city has an origin story, a story of investment, a story of leadership, a story of vision. But every neighborhood may not have that same access, where you have different environmental issues, different public health issues, different economic issues. And East Tampa and the city of Tampa was no different. We had illegal dumping, we had contaminated sites. In fact, 27 brownfield sites are represented in the city of Tampa. Um, we also had safety and poverty issues in the early 90s from gun violence, drug use, um, high unemployment rates, dilapidated housing. We also had issues with healthcare, with access to healthcare, as well as um, healthy foods and clean water as well. 
So we think about in the early 90s, the average household income was $5,000, um, that the community was in desperate despair and a lack of investment and a lot of access and lack of access. But what we did was we did a survey with the community and they talked about the programs and services that they really wanted to see in the community. So the community talked about youth programs to make sure that youth can go on and graduate from high school. They talked about job training and placement programs. They talked about affordable housing initiatives, entrepreneurship, and as well as healthcare. So that really formulated the CDC of Tampa into a comprehensive community development corporation. And we were really excited to see that the, the residents were really talking about economic drivers and not more social services. They weren't talking about daycare or rent assistance or those, or those types of things. They really were talking about economic drivers so they can control their own destiny. So with that, the CDC of Tampa really specialized in reducing disparities in education, employment, and housing. And I'll talk a little bit about education. Um, when we first started, our graduation rates from high school were 40%. Today, they're closer to about 80% with a goal of getting those to 90%. And there's a long history of how we were engaged with the community and the school district to make that happen. But um, a lot of hard work went into that. And I'll touch on the other two throughout the slide, throughout the slide as well. So with our home ownership center, um, we have created over a thousand new homeowners and during the foreclosure pandemic, all that work that we did, we really were concerned that we would end up losing the stability of our housing. Um, so in East Tampa, we have a 42% home ownership rate. And even though we're considered a low income community, um, we're not a transient community. So most times your home ownership rates are anywhere between 10 to 20% in most low income communities with it being transient. So we've done a lot of work to create and stabilize our communities through home ownership. But during the foreclosure pandemic, we, we had to begin working to make sure that our residents can stay in their home. So we've helped close to 2000 people stay in their homes as well. On the real estate development center, um, we've also have built over 300 plus single family homes, um, 277 rental units, and we have probably another 120 that we are hoping to do within the next two years as well. And close to 150,000 square feet of commercial space. So it's also very important as we're talking about place making strategies that we also have the ability to transform the areas that we live in. Uh, on the slide deck, you see a picture of a 80 unit apartment complex. It's called Haley Park. Um, when we talk to our James Haley VA hospital, Veterans um, Hospital, they talked about the need of having residents who can live closer to the hospital because they didn't have access to transportation. So we built, we co-developed the 80 unit apartment complex there. And we also had 25 units that were set aside for homeless veterans. So we use fast vouchers to help house the homeless veterans there. As we talk about some of the commercial spaces, um, you know, we really started by focusing on the human capital credit repair, transforming those type of opportunities, jobs. And once the human capital becomes stronger and more educated consumers, the neighborhood also begins to change as well. So we also wanted to make sure we had banking institutions that can provide capital in our communities. So we had a co-development interest to help bring in Fifth Third Bank in our community, as well as a credit union. So the credit union building was where our housing is where our corporate headquarters was housed and we leased to Suncoast Credit Union and then eventually we ended up selling them the building. So we wanted to make sure we had banks that can provide capital. And uh, we just had an announcement from Fifth Third that they'll be bringing an additional 20 million in dedicated capital for small business development, home ownership and workforce development in East Tampa as well. When we also started thinking about some of the commercial spaces, um, access to healthy foods was, was very critical. Um, the picture to your top left is um, a sit down restaurant. So a lot of people come from all around to stop to spend money um, and also just to meet. So it's a gathering spot. So it's a destination spot. It has a breakfast eatery on one side and the remain of it is an is a, is a Asian cuisine um, sit down restaurant. In the middle is um, a Sprouts Farmer's Market. So we provided a $900,000 loan 
low interest loan to them to help um, complete this project. And in return, they're hiring low income residents from our um, neighboring communities. So it's a really great partnership to bring healthy foods, but also provide hiring opportunities for, for residents. And then the last picture that you see is the San Juan Farmers Market. Um, they have a 24 hour access as well. We have a lot of restaurants that use there that go there as well as residents. And the exciting thing about that, is, again, we provided them a $500,000 um, low interest loan to expand some of their facilities as well as purchase supplies and equipment. But they also hire people, um, especially with backgrounds. And they're a really great partner. Our residents have long tenure with them. And they're really excited about it because with the turnover being lower, that the, that the employees really understand their pro, the produce and can explain that to the consumers. So that really became another great partnership as well. On the career resource side, we've helped to um, job training and placement for close to 12,000 um, residents now, and our household wages have gone up over 35%. And we've done that through also creating a small vocational school that focuses on short-term certifications. So a lot of our clients have background issues, lower educational achievements, just different um, barriers to traditional employment. So we want to find something that we can quickly get them trained and employed. So of course we have great partners like the EPA, there's other federal um, departments as well, but we do brownfield training, we do compressed natural gas training. You can see our local bus transit operator heart line, um, we did the initial transition to compress natural gas training for them so they didn't have to send their workers, incumbent workers across the nation to get trained. We provided that as well. We also partner with our local colleges, um, University of South Florida, um, to teach youth engineering concepts. So they do rain gardens, they think of, they learn about water conservation principles and really being introduced to engineering concepts at an early age. And of course, we also do solar and wastewater training as well. So what's next? What are some of the opportunities that we're continuing to look at and evaluate in our communities? We are also looking at um, a 3D printer to help with the construction of our single family housing. Um, so it's gonna really help to scale that as well as bringing sustainability to the family. So you don't have to worry about termites, you don't have to worry about you know any kind of um, rotting things in the in the home. It's really sustainable. If it if it floods, you don't have to worry about you know flooding issues because of the concrete. So it's also it's a great way to have sustainability for the homeowner as well as not having um, additional issues with you know having materials that you don't need um, on the project as well. We also are looking at two larger projects in East Tampa. So East Tampa, um, we have a high rate of home ownership and that's our greatest asset, but we don't have true anchor institutions or other areas except for kind of food services as places for people to really stop and spend their money or have as employment centers. So the picture to your left is what we're thinking about partnering with our city of Tampa to do to a retention pond. The picture below is what the retention pond looks like currently. And what we're looking at doing is really creating an environmental park that it has an amenities. We can build additional housing um, to the north of that to add that as well. But just have it become an asset to our community versus um, being dumping grounds or just having empty retention ponds in our community. The picture to your right is um, a picture of a smart manufacturing cluster that we're looking at partnering with our city and our local economic development council to build. So one of the challenges that we that we initiated with them is that instead of recruiting companies to come to suburban areas, we need to recruit them to come in the urban core where we can have our school district, our colleges and our residents have opportunities to do training and get jobs on those in the, within those clusters. So the picture below kind of shows what the warehouse district kind of looks like now. Um, it's not thriving. It doesn't really present anything that's an asset to the community per se. But what we want to do is transform that into a very welcoming um, opportunity for technology, innovation, and smart manufacturing. So really excited about the work that we're doing. 
um, my affirmation um, here as well. And I'm going to turn it over to Juanetta to continue the conversation. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, John, for that warm introduction. I also want to thank the hosts of this webinar, and especially Sydney Nolan and EPA, for their support of EJ Communities. My presentation is an overview of how, as a transportation planner working with the community, I used a social impact assessment that led to the development of a $4.8 million community mitigation plan, the first of its kind in the state of South Carolina and the nation. The development of the social impact assessment was a result of the South Carolina State Courts Authority court expansion that consisted of two NEPA projects that included a new three berth port terminal and a new port access road, totaling over $1.5 billion of public investment. The $700 million port terminal would increase capacity by an estimated 1.4 million TEUs or container storage units. It was my belief that the regulatory staffers and consultants working on this project were at best perfunctory in their responsibilities and at the time not accustomed to working with communities of color. Residents voicing their concerns were subjected to bias and forms of microaggressions or were demeaned for not understanding the technical aspects of the permitting processes. One of my first steps was to host several planning tutorials with the residents, including a thorough review of the 730 page EIS. Armed with knowledge, the community became experts on the potential impacts and were in a better position to design their solutions. In addition to the EIS, other documents that I brought to the community's attention was the 1969 National Environmental Policy Act, which require federal agencies to analyze social impacts and provide opportunities for meaningful community engagement. Executive Order 12898, signed in 1994 by President Clinton, strengthened NEPA to require federal agencies to identify and address disparate and adverse environmental impacts of its activities on minority and low income populations. And the State Ports Authority's 404 permit that required the Ports Authority to fully evaluate all impacts and avoid, minimize, or mitigate impacts associated with the construction and operation of the proposed terminal. The study area included over 33 identified neighborhoods as shown on the left. However, only five of the neighborhoods participated in the mitigation negotiations highlighted in red, later known as the Low Country Alliance for Model Communities or LAMPSI. This is an overview of the social economic profile of the community impact area. One example of a disparate impact was the measure of income levels. While high school graduation rates were higher than in other parts of the county and region, the area was experiencing declining population rates, increasing poverty levels that were three times higher than the rest of the county, and income levels that were 50% lower than the median area income. The environmental justice thresholds of the executive order do not define the terms minority or low income. However, Based on guidance provided by the Council on Environmental Quality, the Corps conducted an environmental justice analysis based on race and income of residents within the community study areas and determined the environmental justice threshold was met. This analysis was not included in the original draft EIS. As per NEPA, 
and work with community leaders to identify direct, indirect, cumulative, and public interest impacts that included the existing proliferation of containers stored adjacent to the neighborhoods, noise impacts, and structural damage that the residents perceived to be the result of existing rail operations, and the disintegration of the community by displacement and relocation of prior and existing projects, including the existing interstate and the proposed port access road. Residents had complained for years about the emission and truck traffic from a nearby incinerator that burned trash collected by the local municipalities and one of the state's largest sources of mercury pollution. Residents also voiced objection to approving an air quality permit that would allow expansion of an existing coal terminal due to concerns of diminished air quality from coal debris or PM 2.5 and increased truck and rail traffic. A social impact assessment matrix was developed that identified possible remedies. As per NEPA, the proposed remedies were directly tied to impacts and the benefits could not exceed the extent of the impacts. For example, adjacent properties were being rezoned from residential to heavy industrial in support of port development. This directly led to a decrease in property values, investor speculation, and the continuance of blighting conditions and community isolation. As a remedy, a community land trust was proposed in hopes of stabilizing the neighborhoods and replenishing the housing stock with affordable and energy efficiency homes. This reiterative process involved numerous meetings over the course of a year and revisions to the draft community mitigation plan. The final result was a mitigation plan that addressed the direct and indirect impacts of the proposed port terminal. The mitigation plan was instrumental in garnering federal and state approval of the port permit. An element of the mitigation plan that the community felt strongly about was the development of a revitalization plan. The plan would represent a vision for future growth and development and provide the regulatory tools for turning the community's conceptual projects into reality. The plan was later adopted as an amendment to the city's comprehensive development plan. The community mitigation plan represented one third of the overall cost of the port mitigation plan. In summary, the development of the social impact assessment proved vital to creating a public to public partnership and regaining community trust in institutional systems. It provided a means of leveraging local knowledge and built neighborhood capacity. The social impact assessment prioritized the human environment over the natural environment. It now serves as a model for all NEPA projects within the region and state. I thank you for your time and interest and hope that you will implement some of the tools learned here today. With that, I'll turn it over to Michael. Great, thank you, Winetta. And thanks to everybody who submitted questions so far. We've got many as we usually do. Um, so we are gonna move into the Q&A section of the program and we'll have our panelists uh, turn their cameras on so you can see them for this part. Uh, we'll also have Cindy Nolan join us, join us as well from EPA. And I'll just remind everyone that you continue to uh, submit questions in the questions tab and we'll go for about the next 30 minutes or so um, with uh, the questions that we receive. And I guess I'll start with one uh, for Mashonda. Um, question here from Alexandra Aku Donwich, I believe. Um, probably didn't pronounce your last name correctly. Um, and it is Mashonda, can you talk about what makes an organization successful in the community quarterbacking role? Maybe internal things in the organizations are doing, but also any external circumstances or support that help you to enable your success in that role? Oh, absolutely. Um, 
And thank you for the question. I think the most important thing is that our offices, like Ernest just said, his offices are in the community. We have been here for the past 12 years. And not only are we deeply entrenched in the work, but we're also deeply entrenched in the lived experiences of our residents. I think it's something that you cannot just think about um, the, the, the programmatic thrust. You really truly have life happening within a community. Um, even so much so I'm a resident of the neighborhood. I moved into the neighborhood in September of 2021 um, because I believe in our work and because um, like because of the commitment, not only of our organization and our team members, we're trusted. And that's why things have happened so quickly within our neighborhood. We are a young organization. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at Ernest feeling real, like, all right, I wanna get to those thousands of homes. Um, but we are a young organization to have done so much work in such a short amount of time. Um, and, we, and that is because it's, the work goes at the speed of our trust. Um, and I think we're also trusted in the philanthropic community um, people believed in the work, they, they believed in Woodlawn being its best self, but they also believed in the, the residents leading this process. And they trusted that an organization like ours would walk alongside them and give them the training necessary. So as funds were coming in, whether we were building schools, whether money were going to individual businesses, that we would support them in this process. Great, thank you, Mishanda. Um, here's a question for Winetta from David Totten, who asks, um, I love the public to public partnership what your, aspect of what you were talking about. Did that have to be imposed from the top down by the state or feds or was the local, were the local agencies able to form relationships over common goals? Uh, Winetta, you need to unmute. I apologize. Um, as I was assigned a project manager from the city of North Charleston, working in that community prior to the port pulling that permit, I had already established a relationship, a working relationship within that community. And since this project's inception, we actually uh, broaden and expanding that public relationship to include uh, universities who helped us uh, uh, work and develop that revitalization uh, plan that I discussed earlier. Great, thank you. Okay, here's a question for Cindy uh, related to the handout and what you've been talking about uh, in the beginning. Um, Cindy, is there a there is a long list of handouts on the website. Which handout was the one you mentioned? I think it's the one we actually have in the the um, handout portion, correct? Okay, I was wasn't able to hear what you said, Cindy, so I'm not sure if we're having an audio problem or not. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, here's a question from Becky Bradley, who's asking, for both Mashanda and, and or Ernest, your work is incredible. How did uh, how did comprehensive planning and local planners collaborate with you? And for Winetta, how did the Metropolitan Planning Organization and the Long Range Transportation Plan work and collaborate with you? So I can just start off really quick. We, um, we of course partner with our local municipalities as well. So we have access to their urban planners. And then we also bring in consultants when it's time to do strategic plans and um, get some of those um, really core important plans that we need as well. And likewise, we are deeply uh, entrenched and connected to the city of Birmingham and their planning department. Uh, we also implemented a redevelopment plan um, with the city of Birmingham that was adopted formally by the city council alongside of the residents of the Woodland community. 
and I will make sure to share that later. Uh, the development of the social impact assessment was work I did prior to becoming an MPO administrator. However, I can say I, uh, as a transportation and land use planner, I'd work closely with the state uh, Department of Transportation. And so it was proved beneficial in development of the port access uh, road and that mitigation process, which uh, triggered a separate community mitigation plan on behalf of pulling that port access road forward. Okay, thank you. Um, next question here is from Chelsea Albrucker, who's asking, um, Mashanda, would you, I would like to hear more about the collective voice strategies. Often it is often the loudest or most resources, resourced voices heard. How do you get others involved? Most definitely. So one of the things that Birmingham did very well is that we are we have a formalized neighborhood association system. Like I said, there are four neighborhoods that comprise of the Woodlawn community. Um, and before our work, they were very disjointed and very disconnected, um, had a lot of the similar issues because they are joined uh, neighborhoods, but they weren't communicating with one another. And so one of my jobs when I first started the organization almost nine years ago was to go to every single neighborhood association meeting. And I realized that none of them were communicating with one another. Um, so one of the things that we did, there are two things. Um, we have neighborhood association representation on our board, not an advisory board, our board. So any budgetary decisions, any strategic decisions are, it is connected to the highest of the highest and the wealthy of the wealthy to the, the matriarch or the person that's lived in the community the longest time. Because I think it's important for them to sit at a table to make decisions at that level. The other thing that we did was we created a community council. So we also have a formalized business association here. Uh, Woodlawn has a central business district. In fact, Woodlawn was actually a full-fledged city before being uh, incorporated into the city of Birmingham in 1910. So we have the infrastructure to have a main street. Um, with a thriving business core, which is really exciting that we're going to have transitory development happening within the neighborhood. But when I think about the connectivity points of our community council, now we have the business association members, the neighborhood association members, our uh, community partners, all sitting at the table making collective decisions about what happens in the neighborhood. So it's not just the neighborhood association leadership having a conversation, it's everybody speaking with one voice. Um, an example of that, uh, we, we have some public safety issues happening within our community. And we had a letter from the Business Association president, um, ourselves as Woodlawn United as the collective partnership of our 40 partners in our neighborhood and community leadership, write a letter to the mayor. And that is something that most organizations or communities are not doing. And because we have that collective voice, things happen differently within our neighborhood. There's a level of accountability because we are all paying attention. Um, and, and honestly, the accountability is also on the side of the Woodlawn United side. It is our, it is our, um, it, it's our voice to make sure that their voices are at table. So I'm, uh, I, I try to make sure that it's not just me. If I'm in a meeting, I'm trying to bring along a community member as well, because they need to know what it is to sit in a room, to have a conversation uh, with a funding partner, with a city government official. So it's, it's always a training ground. So we're always learning. Thank you, Mishanda. We actually have another question for you um, here from Daniela Lorenz, who's asking, um, or says first, this was really interesting and inspiring. Have you explored community ownership models to help provide wealth building opportunities? Yes, absolutely. Uh, one of the things I need to talk to Winetta about is that some, we're thinking about community land trusts. We have a lot of land that we need to develop within the neighborhood. And as, uh, as we're thinking about policy shifts, because a lot of the work is also deeply entrenched in that as well. Um, we, we are wanting to make sure that as we're building and we're trying to build slow and intentional, but COVID pushed a lot of our pricing up to the point where we were very uncomfortable that we weren't ready for. So now it's thinking on the policy side, how do we make sure that we're protecting the legacy uh, community members that are not um, 65 and older or, or disabled. So their property values don't increase on them exponentially before they're able to be a part of this process. That's one side, but I'm thinking about community land trust. So Juanita, I will be calling upon you because everybody's trying to figure that out here. It's a complex issue, um, especially with different states and different laws, but we just wanna make sure that we're putting the ownership back into the community as I'm developing. 
I don't, I don't want to hold the land. It was never intended for us to hold the land forever, but we also wanted to make it so it was protected so the residents could actually benefit from this process. Great, thank you. And I'd encourage the panelists, if you all have um, examples as well uh, that fall under the question, a lot of the questions are specific to uh, specific things that were said during the presentation, but if you have other examples you'd like to share, uh, please do in your communities as we move yeah, forward. And if I can just, Go ahead. And this is Ernest, just, to, just to add to that as well, is um, a lot of co-ops are also being evaluated as well. Um, so a lot of times to preserve housing units, um, especially in places like, I mean, it's everywhere now, but you know, Florida is a really hot market right now. DC is a hot market. And in order to preserve some of those housing units, people are coming together to help the residents purchase the buildings that they're in as well. So co-ops from as, as far as being able to buy housing as well as commercial spaces as well. So we have a lot of farmers market, the same old farmers market that we showed you. There's about a 10 acre site um, that's attached to that. And we're thinking about how we can create co-ops where they actually own the produce to be able to sell it and distribute it as well. Sorry, uh, another question for Ernest. Um, can you talk more about what mitigation homes are? Um, I'm not familiar with the term mitigation home. Um, I think when we're, when we're talking about the 3D homes, we're looking if if that's may may be what it's in reference to. We're looking at how we can create more innovative um, and sustainable homes. So of course, you know, in in places like Florida, we have a lot of termites. So when you have um, your house that may have um, you know your drywalls attached to wood studs in your home when you put up drywall. So you may have brick sometimes, sometimes you have wood and termites can really come in there. If you ever have rain or flooding issues, which we have a lot in the South as well, um, by having it be cement, you're, you know, you can pour water everywhere and it and it won't affect the, the actual house. So if it's it's more sustainable from that standpoint, I'm ho hopefully that's more of the question that they were getting to. Okay, thank you. Um, next question here, I think it's for everyone generally. Um, how do you address the environmental advocacy organizations that often are more concerned with broad issues like climate change or resiliency and not the retention of current residents in bringing about changes? I don't know if anybody wants to take that one on first. I, I, I think I'm going to take that one. Uh, when I think about our community and how I literally have a rail station to myself, uh, airport to my north and a highway that just completely cuts through it. Um, I think about um, our transit oriented development and our bus rapid transit. Um, we, uh, my, I'm looking out the window because I'm looking at the land. Our commercial revitalization partner, Red Birmingham, we, we collaborated together to buy these two parcels adjacent to the transit or, uh, or the bus rapid transit line. And, but the land has basically all these environmental issues. And when you think about wanting to build affordable housing and mixed income housing, you have the complexity of a rail station. So you're having all these different things where you want to make sure that you give high quality affordable options within a neighborhood, but all of these other things are barriers to that. So that's why it's important for us to have continued conversations with, uh, with Cindy Nolan and her team and the EPA. And how, how are we addressing these issues and making sure a community actually is benefiting from all of these dynamic things that we want to do but there's just so many barriers to affordable housing so we're just we're working through that and i think that is having conversations and and that's what the importance of us being on the ground to show that we can have a conversation with norfolk southern uh, and they are out willing to have um, not only just have the conversation but also build out solutions in which we can make our community uh, less disjointed having conversations with the the, the transit uh, birmingham transit and all of these other, uh, ALDOT, uh, Alabama D Department of Transit, because now they're wanting to close off um, an, an, an off-ramp to our, our neighborhood because it disjointed it. So now we have the ability to basically think about the full planning of our neighborhood and how does it benefit not only our neighborhood now, but five to 10 years from now. So I think it's just, an, I think it's important in relationship. It's, a relude, it's rooted in relationship, but it's rooted in us being on the ground to make sure that we can tell the right story. 
I want to say that I uh, experienced this firsthand. I found the biases in uh, most of the environmental systems. Um, I found that the developers had co-opted most of the environmental groups in the area that I was uh, working in at the time. And so uh, the citizens and residents had to become their own advocates. Um, EPA um, was a big proponent of these environmental justice areas, and they came in and formed a partnership, um, a long-term partnership that's still lasting um, within these groups. But at the um, start of it and the heart of it is that the citizens themselves had to form and become their own uh, advocates and environmental justice specialists. And EPA provided the training for them and the space for them to do so. And, and this is Ernest, and just to add to that, you know, I, I think East Tampa is very special and sometimes we have like really qualified people that we've been able to, that are homegrown, that are like engineers and are in these places. So they position themselves in these key committees as well to help drive the narrative so that the narrative isn't a top-down approach. It also becomes a community approach. So like in Florida, we're looking at solar technology and, you know, the deregulation of potential energy um, components as well. So it's a, a you know a long list of opportunities just to have people in the right places that can help drive um, community answers um, as well. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another question for everybody uh, from Paige Pryor, who was asking, "How is your relationship with local political leaders and the political will for the work that you do?" I often experience less than ideal relationships with city leaders and powerful groups who may not want to see this kind of equitable growth and development. Okay. Well, let me say that I'm formal. I formally worked in that area. I, worked in, I have another position now just because of that. You're right. Um, it's a very real thing. It's not seen favorable, the work that we do or um, working on behalf of environmental justice communities. I think on, on our side is that people, it's the idea that a lot of things are happening within our community and it's not happening in other places within the city. And instead of seeing the growth and the ability to take everything that we've learned and lessons learned and transform that to a different neighborhood, a lot of people don't see that vision. So it's it's been hard over the past decade. I think within our new leadership, we have a new city council. Um, we have a really great relationship with the mayor's office. People are starting to see okay, what can happen in Woodlawn can happen in other places within our neighborhood or within our city. Um, even so much so that we're having our full city council come visit our neighborhood for the first time ever in 12 years um, to tru truly see the comprehensive nature of our work. But I think it, it can get to the point where um, some city officials, it, 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 it can be played against other neighborhoods. So I think it's rooted again in relationships and having very hard conversations um, to show that if you could do this here, you could do this in another neighborhood and another community. So support is always needed. Yeah, and I'll just add the relationships are, are critical in making that happen. So we just had an event today and our mayor um, was here speaking and she talked about when she was the chief of police doing drug marches with us. So the relationship started before she even got into office, right? And now that she's in office, she has these fond memories of the work that we're doing. But then we also have to hold people accountable. You know, it's nothing for us to go down and have a contingency to go down to city council or our county commissioners and say, this is what we demand. And this is what we see as a vision of a better society or a better neighborhood or a better community as well. Okay, thank you, Ernest. Here's another question for everybody from Katie Wellner, who's noting that uh, we have a lot of planners in our audience as usual. And so she's asking, what are some of the most helpful things that planners and local government has have done to help your organization and projects? I don't know who wants to take that one first. So I can jump in and just give a couple of quick perspectives. So oftentimes we have visions of um, some of the work that we want to accomplish and having people who are on the inside of that bureaucracy to let you know, well, these are the federal funds we're thinking about bringing. These are the drawings that we have. This is what the mayor wants to do. And these are the natural alliances that we can bring are critical in making sure that we have 
um, the ability to, you know, have things come to fruition. So we literally have been written into some of our municipal grants to do certain things. And having that insight about what's coming, what the vision is going to be, is also very critical. I echo that, um, Ernest. We, we have the same relationship within our planning department. Um, they do give us a heads up when things are happening. Um, even when people who don't mean our community well want to either put a business or put some type of a different type of housing into the neighborhood, they always send them to us to have the conversation because they know that um, we're the ones that are convening and making sure their neighborhood is on board with everything that's happening. Um, but I think it's also rooted um, in our comprehensive plan. So we were alongside of the city of Birmingham as we did the update to the comprehensive plan, making sure that we weren't doing spot zoning, making sure that everything was comprehensive and it made sense. Um, and I think that's, it, you have to have a really great relationship with your city planners or just planners in general. Um, there are certain things that they don't see that you see and then the other way around. So um, everybody brings uh, great expertise to the table. It's just a matter of listening and uh, adhering to what everybody's roles are. Yeah, I agree with Mashonda as a land use and transportation planner myself. I think that the relationships between the municipalities and the constituent, their constituencies and their council and elected officials are very important and instrumental into implementation of any processes. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is actually for you, Winetta, as well, from Anna Olvera, who's asking, um, I've been tasked to help a local entity with a raise grant and NEPA is new to me. Do you have any advice that you can give when preparing for NEPA requirements? Just read the Policy Act itself and get as much as literature, any literature, uh, reach out to your EPA representative, um, your FHWA representatives and your local DOT who are well versed in NEPA policies and procedures and the per permitting process. Great, thank you. Um, here's a question for Cindy, and I think we were still having trouble with your audio before, Cindy, so it, maybe we'll check to make sure it's working here. But here's a question. Um, can you speak to how EPA Brownfields grants can be tools for communities? It seems like you're still muted. I don't know if you need to check your audio again. I, it's, you're not muted on our control panel. That's why it's odd to see this. Hmm. And it was working. Yeah, and it still doesn't seem to be working. John, do you have any suggestions? That's that she would make sure that uh, the proper microphone is selected under the audio settings. The okay. Audio tab. Yeah, we could hear you at the beginning. That's why it was odd that you're not coming through now. You're not hearing her either, right, John? That is correct. I do not hear her. Hmm. Yeah, it's not working. I, maybe, Cindy, if you could log out and log back in, because we would like to hear you speak. So let's try that and see if that works. Thanks. Okay, well, we'll keep moving here with other questions. And again, thank you for um, everybody in the audience for submitting these. Um, here's one from Brandon Bell, who's asking, um, what is an example of a hard conversation that you've had that led to a good outcome in your work? And what is the issue res you resolved and what hard news had to be shared or discussed? Anybody has an example for that? So this is this is Ernest. Um, I think every day we 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 have difficult conversations, but in a respectful manner. Um, you know, so we, I just talked about the relationship that we have with the mayor, and they were, they're planning a hundred million dollar project here in in Tampa, and the staff some way didn't engage the community as much as they traditionally do. So while it was a wonderful event, we had to, um, you know, talk to them about, we want to know specifically, because East Tampa is a predominantly black neighborhood, how many black 
um, you know, my black um, small business were going to be able to take place and participate in this. How many residents will be able to get jobs with this with this project? So all those great to bring services to East Camp. We also want to make sure that we leverage every economic opportunity. And um, you know, most times when things become um, are brought to a person's attention, you know, they they definitely see things the way that we do as well. Like we want to see a, have an adverse city and an inclusionary city. But in the excitement of making our project happen, sometimes we don't always think about every leveraging opportunity. And that's what we are built for as a place, you know, as a place making kind of strategist. Everything that happens, we are always looking, can we create jobs? Can we create and support small businesses? You know, can we, you know, do um, youth programs? You know, we're always thinking about how it can create an opportunity to give an advantage to our community members as well. Thanks, Ernest. I see Cindy's back. Uh, can we see if we, if you? Okay. Uh, yes. Michael, you can you hear me? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Great. Okay. Um, this is a great opportunity for me to put in the pitch that EPA has unprecedented new resources under the infrastructure bill handed to us from from Congress to support communities in their redevelopment efforts. And I always refer to two types of support: the easy button and the hard button. So the easy button are the series of options we have where we control the contractor and we can execute the work directly on behalf of the community. It's a faster approach, but it's a much more limited resource. The second is the hard button, and that is to apply for competitive grants, which is a slower process, but bigger money and much more uh, latitude to do work. And um, we, would love to support communities. What we do is we start with the easy button. We use that as a wedge into training more about brownfields and what we can do and get them to apply for a competitive grant, which is then the hard button. Um, so it's important to be in touch with any regional brownfields representative or our Office of Brownfields and Land Revitalization in Washington and learn much more about those resources. Right, thanks, Cindy. And in addition to having the handout here in the in the chat function, we'll also include it on the webinar archive page with all the other uh, resources that have been shared here today, as well as in the previous uh, program. So uh, I think as the number of programs has expanded, now we've done six here today, uh, there's been a lot of great uh, information shared there. So I would encourage everybody to visit uh, smartgrowth.org uh, to see that information. And, and if you haven't attended any of the any or all the prior programs you can go back and watch. Okay, I just recognizing where we are in the time, um, I think maybe what I'll do is just ask uh, our three panelists uh, if they have any kind of closing thoughts or takeaways, and then I'm going to, we'll end it with Cindy and, and any uh, kind of direction that she would offer. And maybe we'll start with um, Mashonda first and we'll go to Ernest and then Winetta. Um, again, I just want to say thank you, Cindy Nolan, for the opportunity, um, as well as the Smart Growth uh, Network for allowing us to share our, our, our work that's happening here in Woodlawn. The thing that I would continue to leave you with is that get proximate um, to your communities and the works uh, that are happening here locally, uh, but then also think about the policy shifts that we, we need to be addressing the larger issues. There are 28 communities that are doing the same work across this country. Um, it might be a different neighborhood feel. It might be single family detached. It might just be a full new landscape of houses and everything being built in one area. But the problem is our policies are not um, suited to make sure that we can address these issues. It is a great idea and awesome that we are getting this infrastructure money that are flowing through, um, the ARPA monies that are flowing through, but we've got to think about the long-term strategies as to what happens after this moment. So um, I just continue to leave people with that. This is not, this is just the beginning. Um, and I look forward to connecting to the fellow panelists um, for learning more information from the things that they've shared today as well. So thank you for having me. And thank you for um, this opportunity. And I want to thank EPA. So as we think about them as a partner from everywhere from infrastructure work to actually job training and, and certification programs and how all that fits in a very intentional manner. So the takeaway that I have is just trying to be very intentional in our approach and our thought process and what we're trying to accomplish. So thank you again. 
I too want to thank the uh, EPA, uh, the University of Maryland, and Smart Growth America for sponsoring this webinar today. Um, I also want to leave um, with my uh, fellow planners uh, just to use their knowledge to do more, to use their knowledge, tools, and resources to do more on behalf of these underrepresented communities within their areas. Um, although they may be uh, not deemed experts um, as far as the technical processes um, within city government, they are expert um, within their fields and their uh, residencies. So just reach out and do more. And I just want to thank our panelists because they've been just inspirational and in all the communities that I have interviewed in the last two years have just been so high energy, so inspirational. And I have to say, a lot of this work with nonprofits is fairly new to EPA, particularly in Brownfields, as we expand our grant opportunities to that universe of uh, communities. And um, it's just been amazing to learn how these nonprofits operate in communities and, and really build bridges in, in fill gaps that state, local, and federal programs will never be able to fill. Um, and their sustainability goes over multiple generations. It's just so impressive. Um, the entire series, of course, is brought together by our, our smoke, Smart Growth sponsors. And we will continue after today's discussion to add additional materials. There's been requests from the commenters uh, that we add some additional materials and we will continue to do that. So please check back with the website um, a little bit later to find those materials. And thanks, Michael, we'll turn it back to you. Great, thanks, Cindy. Yes, we will be sending out an email to everybody who registered and attended today once the recording of the webinar has been processed and posted, and then that will include a link for you to um, see uh, all the materials we're talking about. We'll also be sharing the um, questions that we received today with the panelists as well, and I think you saw their contact information if you want to uh, contact them directly. So with that, we'll conclude our webinar today, National Models and Methods for Achieving Equitable Development. I'd offer, like to offer a great big thank you to our panelists for a great presentation, to everyone who attended today, and to John Coleman, our communications and technology guru who helps to make this all happen. As I just mentioned, the complete recording of today's webinar will be posted on smartgrowth.org. Also, for those of you who have requested one, all attendees will receive an email that will contain a link to a personalized certificate of participation. Please look for this follow-up email if you need that to claim other continuing education credits. When you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback so that we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. And finally, keep an eye on smartgrowth.org and your email inbox for details on other future webinars, including Dream, Play, Build, Hands-On Community Engagement for Enduring Spaces and Places, which will be next Friday, February 25th at 1 p.m. Eastern, and the Comprehensive Plan Sustainable, Resilient, and Equitable Communities for the 21st Century, which will be held on Thursday, March 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern, and we'll be sending out a blast for that shortly. With that, I wish everybody a great day.